Hi everyone, thanks for having me to give this talk today. I included a couple of pictures of myself to give a face to the voice since I'm not going to be able to give this presentation to you in person. For the presentation, I'm just going to be giving you all some fun facts about sea otters and the path I've taken kind of as a budding marine biologist. So a little bit about me, I'm originally from South Central Indiana. Um, so not much going on in the way of marine biology here. All of my initial experiences in marine biology were all mostly through zoos and aquariums like the Indianapolis Zoo, which has a really nice uh, dolphin area and it's just a really nice zoo in general. And then other zoos and aquaria like Shedd Aquarium in Chicago and SeaWorld in Orlando. I stayed in Indiana to do my bachelor's degree after high school. I went to Butler University and got my bachelor's degree in biology and French. Um, and then after that, I realized that I probably needed a bit more experience with marine biology if I wanted to go further in that field. So I did a year of internships down at Moat Marine Laboratory in Sarasota, Florida. I worked uh, with two of their different programs. The first one is their stranding investigation team. This team responds to calls from people who find sick, hurt, or dead marine mammals and turtles that may wash up on shore or may be found at sea um, acting weirdly or in, might be entangled in some fishing gear. The other half of my time there I spent working with their rehabilitation hospital which works with those sick turtles and uh, whales and dolphins and tries to get them back to health so they can be released back into the wild. Or if they can't be released back into the wild, they try to find them a home at a zoo or aquarium where they can live the rest of their life comfortably. Uh, after that, I applied for and was accepted into a master's program at San Diego State University in their evolutionary biology program. And while um, evolutionary biology isn't necessarily marine biology, all of my research that I did there was um, in marine biology with marine mammals. I actually studied baleen and baleen whales uh, while I was there, kind of how their baleen forms. And baleen is uh, those little bristles that they have at the top of their mouth that they use to filter feed instead of having teeth like we see in um, all the toothed whales and dolphins. So down here, this is a baleen rack when it's outside of the mouth. And then these two uh, little videos show a blue whale um, doing some filter feeding. You can see after it's gulped down a big thing of water, it's pushing the water out of its mouth, um, but keeping all of the fish or krill or plankton that was inside of that water in its mouth until all the water's gone and then it swallows down its prey without the water. And that's how filter feeding works. Uh, after that, uh, I applied for a PhD position at Texas A&M University at Galveston um, in their marine biology program. And while I've been here, I've worked with um, a salmon project looking at the salmon population up in Alaska. I've done some photo identification work of dolphins that live in the Galveston Ship Channel and Galveston Bay. But the majority of my personal research has all been on these little sea otters um, up in Alaska, kind of looking at um, their activity and their behavior. So before I jump into sea otters, I thought I'd give a little plug for my favorite marine mammals. And while sea otters are very cute and fluffy, they're just not quite as cute and fluffy as seals. And seals are also exceptionally interesting animals because they have to spend a lot of their time in the water, but also on land. And so they have a lot of similar adaptations for living in the water that you would see in whales and dolphins. Like they're able to hold their breath for a very long time, able to dive to very deep depths, but they also are still able to be on land, which whales and dolphins can't do. A few other little cool facts about different seal species. First off, this is a hooded seal. You can kind of see uh, where it gets its name from this little black hood on top. But males 
will also blow out this little red balloon that comes out of their nose. And they do this whenever they're around other males or females and they're trying to show them that they're big and tough. Kind of like when a peacock, a male peacock, shows off his feathers. Just not quite as pretty. Uh, another really cool seal is the leopard seal. It's one of the largest seal species and is found down in Antarctica. And it is kind of the southern counterpart to the polar bear, which lives up at the North Pole. So it ha basically um, fills the same ecological niche, has the same job in the environment that the polar bear does, except it's just found down south. So it's going to be eating um, penguins, seabirds, and even some small marine mammals. But interestingly, while it's eating all of those large animals, it's also eating some of the smallest animals that are found down around the Antarctica, the shrimp and the krill. And even though it doesn't have baleen, like the baleen whales, it still filter feeds. So um, you can kind of see its little teeth here. They are kind of comb-shaped in the back. So it'll gulp down a big gulp of water, just like a baleen whale, and then it'll close its mouth, and then it'll push water between these little combs, uh, these little comb teeth that it has. Um, so the water will all escape its mouth, but the krill and the shrimp will still stay stuck behind those teeth so that the seal can swallow them after it's gotten rid of all the water. Because no matter if you're a whale, a dolphin, or a seal, you don't drink seawater because it's way too salty. Uh, so that's just a really cool thing that they do. They're filter feeders, kind of like baleen whales. The last cool thing that I wanted to talk to you guys about are seal whiskers. So this is a bearded seal. They have really big whiskers, but um, what I'm about to tell you is true for all seals. So their whiskers are very sensitive. Um, so specialized and sensitive that we actually call them vibrissi instead of whiskers. And underwater, they can kind of detect changes in uh, the flow of water around them. So as a fish swims through the water, you can kind of see that it has this wake that comes off behind it. And a seal is able to use its whiskers to detect this change in water flow, even after the fish has swam by a little while ago, and it can follow up behind, follow this trail until it finds the fish and then can catch that fish for dinner. So those are just a few quick, interesting seal facts um, before I go fully back into sea otters to talk to you guys about them and uh, the cool things that they do. Before I do that though, I wanna give you guys a little history about sea otters. So uh, sea otters had historically been found around much of the coastal North Pacific. You won't see them too far north because um, for them to be able to hunt and find their prey, um, they can't have any ice forming um, on the water. So that's why they don't go up here into the Bering Sea and up here into the Arctic Ocean, um, just because there's far too much ice that forms up there. Um, so uh, when Europeans first came into the North Pacific, they found sea otters and found out that they have very dense, very soft fur. And so a lot of people wanted that fur for themselves and hunted the sea otters for it. And by the early 1900s, when they were finally protected um, in 1911, there were only about 1,000 to 2,000 individuals left in the world. And those few individuals were found in these small little populations kind of dotted around the North Pacific when they used to be found in all of this yellow area. Since they've become protective over the last hundred years or so, <clears throat> they've expanded their area and recolonized a lot of that area that they lost. So over here in this picture, all the yellow is where you can find sea otters now, and the red is the area that they still haven't re-expanded to yet. The reason that they're relatively slow at recolonizing their old territory is that sea otters um, don't undergo long migrations like you might see in some of the whales that might go all the way from Hawaii out here in the middle of the Pacific up to Alaska or over to the California coast. Um, they generally are pretty slow at spreading um, from wherever they're born. 
And that's just because they have very high metabolic rates. And your metabolism or your metabolic rate is essentially the energy you, that you use on a day-to-day -day basis to live and do all the activities that you like to do. So their met metabolic rate is two and a half times that which it, we see in other mammals. So they have to spend a lot of time foraging and looking for their food. And their prey are generally invertebrates like clams, sea urchins, crabs, and other things like that that are found on the seafloor. So they're gonna dive down and then kind of root around, dig around in the sand and the rocks, looking for these clams and urchins and crabs and so on. And then they'll bring those prey up to the surface. And they'll either hold that prey between their paws or they have these little skin flaps underneath their arm um, that almost look like, or work like little purses. So they can hold a couple of clams or a couple of sea urchins underneath each of their arms and then have more things to bring up to the surface to eat. They don't uh, dive that long or that deep in comparison to other marine mammals. They only dive for less than four minutes or so, um, and not usually deeper than 60 feet, as opposed to things like seals and whales, which can dive for hundreds or thousands of feet um, deep, and for 30 minutes to over two hours long for their dives. So uh, moving on to some other unique adaptations for sea otters. Uh, before I do that, a little bit of background. So when marine mammals live in water, it's very easy for that water to steal the body heat away from those marine mammals. So they have to have adaptations for insulating themselves. And most marine mammals have this thick layer of fat called blubber, but sea otters don't have any blubber. They don't have this fat layer. Instead, they insulate themselves by having very dense fur. So their fur, they have approximately a million hairs per square inch, as opposed to human hair, which only has about 2,000 hairs per square inch on your head. So sea otters have, about, that have, or have hair that's about 500 times denser than human hair. So here's a couple of little pictures of sea otter fur, just a little tuft of sea otter fur. And then, sorry, a little microscopic view. So here, uh, the fur has been shaved, so it's all the same length. But you can see here, um, sea otters have this one thicker hair called a guard hair, and then lots of little under furs, and all those together will come from a single follicle. So what this kind of comes out to look like is that we have these nice long guard hairs, and then all of these shorter, denser under furs that sit closer to the skin. And sea otters are going to rub their fur um, like this and do this behavior that we call felting. And essentially why we call it felting is that it's going to rub these under furs together um, and make them kind of lock up uh, with each other until it forms a really tight grid. Um, and in that grid, there are going to be these tiny little air bubbles. And the grid is so tight, and the air bubbles are so small, that water that's out here in the guard hairs, as the, water, as the sea otter swims at the surface or dives underwater, isn't going to, the water isn't going to be able to penetrate through the under fur and through this little air layer to get to the skin. So the sea otter is going to have this little layer of protection of air and fur that keeps them from getting wet, even when they're in the water. And it's that air layer that protects them and keeps them warm. Uh, it's kind of like the difference between, uh, if you've ever go diving, um, most people will wear a wetsuit, and a wetsuit is just a layer of rubber, um, very similar to what you see when a marine mammal has blubber. If a person goes diving in really cold water, they'll instead wear what's called a dry suit, um, which basically keeps you dry inside of the suit by having an air layer there, just like the sea otter's little air layer. The other way that sea otters stay warm in the cold North Pacific waters is that they have this really high metabolic rate. So while this means that they need a lot more food 
um, to keep up their energy. Um, whenever we, our metabolism is working to produce energy for us to do our daily activities, it's also producing heat. So you can kind of think of this really high metabolic rate as giving the otters this little internal furnace that keeps them warm. And over here in this picture, you can kind of see just the plethora of all of the different food items that these guys will eat. So over here we have some sea stars, we have a scallop, some crabs, a giant octopus, some clams, and some sea cucumbers. Uh, next, I wanted to talk to you guys about some special senses. So our special senses are things like sight, touch, um, smell, taste, um, and hearing. And depending on whether you are in the air or underwater, those special senses will either work differently or not at all. So for sea otters, um, both their sight and their touch work well, both in the air and underwater. Um, their eyes are able to focus both in the air and underwater, which if you've ever tried to open your eyes underwater in a pool, you'll probably have noticed that your eyes uh, are a little bit blurry, your vision is a little blurry, and that's just because human eyes aren't built to focus underwater, but sea otters are able to do both. Next, I wanna to talk to you about the sea otter's sense of touch. They have whiskers that are very sensitive, just like in seals, so we actually call their whiskers vibrissi also. Um, so they're able to use them to help them find prey underwater in the sand and in, in those rocks and be able to detect whether something under them is a rock or maybe a shell of a, of a clam. They're also able to use their paws. Their paws are very sensitive. They have about the same sensitivity that we have as humans in our fingertips. And if you wanna do a little experiment and learn more about uh, sensitivity of the sense of touch, try having someone touch your arm with the tip of a pen when your eyes are closed. And then while keeping your eyes closed, try to touch the same spot on your arm with a pen that you're holding. And then have the person that touched your arm initially uh, measure the distance between those two spots on your arm. Then try and uh, redo the experiment, touching, having them touch a point on your fingertip, and then trying to touch the same spot on your fingertip with your pen, again, keeping your eyes closed. You should see that the distance between the two spots on your arm is much larger than the two spots that you touch on your fingertip. And that's just because your fingertip is much more sensitive and it gives you a much better sense of where on your finger you are touching something. So you get a much better idea of texture um, whenever you touch something. Uh, the next two senses, hearing and smelling, work really well in the air, but not very well or not at all under the water. So if you've ever gone and swam in the water and got water up your nose, you know it's not a very pleasant sensation. And the same is true for sea otters. They are actually able to close off their nose and their ears when they dive underwater so they, they won't get any uh, water in them. So that means that they definitely aren't gonna be able to smell anything with their noses closed underwater, but also just in general, um, our senses as mammals um, don't work underwater. Um, we need a sense to be in the air for us to be able to sense them and to be able to smell them. Their ears, again, work really well in the air, just like ours, and we're able to detect sounds and where they're coming from, whether they're coming from the right, the left, in front of us, or behind, but underwater, uh, not as much. Um, we can still hear things underwater, just like the sea otters can, but because um, that sound isn't coming through our ears, it's instead coming through the bones of our skull, just because of the difference in the way sound travels in water versus in air. It just makes it so it's more difficult to hear, and it makes it exceptionally difficult for us to be able to detect uh, the direction from where a sound came. Uh, the last little bit I want to talk to you guys about is just my own personal research. Um, I'm looking at two different things. I'm looking at sea otter general activity, 
So what they do during a day, we call that their daily activity budgets. And we're looking at these six different behaviors, which include resting when sea otters are just kind of either sleeping or not being very active um, at the surface of the water, grooming when they're felting their fur, kind of maintaining their insulation, swimming when they're just going from place to place, um, usually um, moving through the water with their tummies up, just kicking with their back feet. Um, foraging, which is all the time they spend diving, looking for a prey, and also all the time they spend at the surface eating that prey. Unlike um, seals, sea lions, whales, and dolphins, which all eat their prey while they're underwater, sea otters always bring their prey up to the surface before they eat it. And then these last two behaviors are a little bit more male otter specific. So as I mentioned earlier, males tend to hold territories. Um, and to hold that territory, they need to patrol it so that they can chase away other males and also um, interact with potentially any female that wants to come in. So when they're patrolling, they will usually swim with their tummies down so that way they can see and potentially smell any otters that might be in their area. And then lastly, interacting is just whenever an otter um, interacts with another otter, which is usually somewhat unusual. Um, usually it's a male otter chasing off another male or a male trying to mate with a female. While otters will raft together occasionally, they generally don't interact even though they're floating near each other. So here's my study site, just real quickly. Um, while I go to school down in Texas, all of my research happens up here in Alaska in Prince William Sound, um, specifically in this smaller bay of Prince William Sound called Simpson Bay. And like I said before earlier, sea otters is, um, were extinct through much of their uh, original range in the early 1900s. And sea otters only reestablished themselves in Simpson Bay in the late 1970s and early 1980s. Since then, for the last uh, 20 or so years, we've had a relatively stable population in the area with a small 10% increasing trend. So I'm interested in seeing if whether the male territories uh, which were studied about 10 years ago to see if they've changed at all as the population has increased and also similarly to look and see if the behaviors of the otters have changed in those 10 years. So a little bit more about sea otter behavior. Um, so males practice something called resource defense polygyny. So like I said before, they are going to hold territories, especially the larger male otters that are a bit older. They're gonna patrol areas and try to chase away any smaller uh, male otters. And then if they see any female otters, they're gonna to try to interact with them and try to mate with them. So usually when this happens, it's a single female, but I've got a clip over here uh, of one of the rare instances where a male, uh, I'm just um, interacting with a female that has a pup. So um, while I was doing this, I was on a boat, so sorry for the shaky camera work. Um, but over here on the left, we have the little pup, um, and the otter that we're seeing here is the male otter, or the back of the male otter, as he wrestles with the female. And you can occasionally catch a glimpse of her, but she's facing towards the shore here, so it's a little bit difficult to see her, but occasionally you'll see her kind of over to the side in front of him. Yeah, that's kind of what it looks like when these otters interact with each other, especially males and females. So the last thing I wanted to share with you guys is just kind of the results of my behavior uh, data collection. So this first bar graph shows the data that was collected 10 years ago, and the second shows my data. So we see that the otters are spending a lot more time uh, foraging for food, and less time grooming, resting, and patrolling. And my hypothesis is that they're doing this because as the population has grown, the prey in the area has become uh, less prevalent. So there's less um, clams and crabs in the area for them to find, so they're having to spend more time trying to find them. 
So that means if they're spending more time doing this, they have to spend less time doing other behaviors, which has different um, causes and effects for them that, um, that I look at in my research. Um, and before I say bye, I just wanted to give a few quick uh, bits of advice for success um, if you plan on going into the marine biology field or in any field in general. Um, first off, uh, try to get as much experience in the field as you can, whether that's uh, working uh, a job that's related to the field or doing internships like I did. Um, also, try to find mentors. Um, people that are already working in the careers you're interested in and ask them questions about that career, uh, what they do on a day-to-day -day basis and so on, just so you can get a better idea of whether you're actually truly interested in doing all those tasks um, that are involved in that career. And then lastly, um, always make sure that you keep yourself open to other careers that are related. Um, you may think that you want to do something in the field of marine biology, but you may not know that there's this other job that's out there that you would like even better. So always keep yourself open to change in your mind in the future. Um, with that, I just want to say thanks for having me today. I hope you enjoyed my presentation um, and bye. <laughs>